What's up everyone, it's Severingo back with another World of Warcraft Season of Discovery guide. Today we'll be discussing how to DPS as a Feral Druid in Black Fathom Deeps. This will be a little bit different than my previous videos in the sense that I'll be watching the recording of a recent run and walking through strategy with overlaid tips and tricks as we progress through the raid. This raid wasn't anything crazy, we weren't attempting a speedrun here, multiple people died on Gamu Ra from bumping into each other, but it's a 19 and a half minute run give or take which is perfect for our purposes here today. First up, we have Baron Aquanus. This is an extremely quick fight if everyone knows what they're doing. Depending on if you want to see higher numbers for that dopamine hit and aim for that sweet 99 parse, save one of the elementals for your warriors, rogues, and feral druids to get rage, slice and dice, and savage roar up. When it's about to go down and you have enough combo points, make your way to the boss, cast Savage Roar, and then have your ranged finish it off to start the fight. As a Feral Druid, you're going to want to be power shifting, which I've explained how to do in my previous videos using the overlaid macro on the screen. The rotation you should be aiming for is as follows. Because Baron Aquanus is an elemental, he's immune to bleed and poison effects. So with that being said, you'll only be using Mangle and then Shred on clear casting procs if possible to get behind the boss all the while maintaining Savage Roar for your 30% increase in physical damage. As you can see in the video, sometimes it's not possible to get behind the boss, like me here because I'm tanking. So in that case, just substitute the Shred with another Mangle. Pretty quick and easy fight. In terms of the boss's mechanics, there are only two things that your team has to worry about. The first is an 8 second debuff that will randomly be applied to one of your teammates called Depth Charge. This requires said teammate to jump ship into the water because once the countdown expires, that person will blow upward into the air taking anyone on the same level with them. If you're in the water, the bubbles provide underwater breathing and a speed boost, whereas the whirlpools pull you downward causing delays. If you get knocked off as a druid, you could always use aquatic form to speed things up. At the 30 second mark, which we actually didn't make it to here, Baron will cast what's called Bubble Beam. Bubble Beam will cause him to slowly turn in a clockwise direction, shooting out a spout of water, knocking anyone in melee range in front of him off the platform. So just stay behind the boss here. Side note, as a Feral DPS, you're always going to want to be either behind or on the side of a boss, depending on if it has some sort of tail swipe mechanic or not, because that allows you to shred on clear casting procs, but it also makes it so that you can't get parried by the boss. Right after Baron goes down, swap out your Glove Rune for Sunfire because the big turtle Gamu Ra is next. On the trash leading up to the fight and every other boss fight here on after, it's a good idea to stop power shifting when you're approaching in order to pool as much mana as you can to ideally cap before the fight begins. The add on 5 second rule combined with Druid Bar Classic is a nice combo to always keep tabs on how much you have left. Because Gamu Ra is susceptible to spell damage, you're going to want to swap out Mangle for Sunfire and I personally keep Savage Roar, but someone in my comment section says Star Surge is the optimal rune for this, which I totally see being correct. For all intents and purposes though, I like to keep things as simple as possible as long as they're still effective, so I keep Savage Roar because it's very similar to the rotation you use for every other fight, you just swap out Sunfire for Mangle. When Gamu Ra's shield hits zero, you're going to want to run away from the boss because he's going to knock back anyone in his proximity, but also it will damage everybody in the raid. When you get knocked back, you also run the risk of running into a bunch of these orbs which can kill you, which is what happened to multiple people in this raid. So build up combo points with Sunfire, don't power shift until his shield is down, because this is a longer fight you're going to want to conserve mana. As a side note here, you can see me using the power shifting mana pot macro that I've discussed in a previous video and I've overlaid here for you. A Feral Druid's damage is very dependent on mana, so any little bit that you can get, especially at these lower levels really helps your sustain on longer fights. I'm just maintaining Savage Roar and trying to get 5 combo point rips. Yes, I might not be the number 1 rank in the world, but it's a pretty easy way to get a 99 parse, and no group is going to scoff at that. Feel free to write everything I'm doing wrong in the comments section below, but for 99% of the people, this will get the job done effectively, and you'll still be performing extremely well compared to the rest of the Druid population. Once Gamu Ra goes down, remember to swap back to Mangle on your Glove Rune, have your team res any fallen comrades, and then we're on to Lady Seraphis. Remember when I mentioned that Feral Druids are extremely mana dependent? I stock up on a bunch of water before the run, because I'll either wait while other people are fighting to drink, or if it's a speed run, I'll throw in some drink walking. More detailed explanation on how to do that is in my flag carrying guide. 
but essentially, you're gonna wanna use five second roll and click on the drink right before the ticker hits the end of the bar. This gives you the mana regeneration, but it allows you to move in between. Just like last fight, you're gonna wanna hold off on the power shifting because it's a quick fight and you wanna be capped out for it. One note about these spellcasters, if you don't hit them up until wherever you wanna fight them, you won't get frozen. You'll see us finally doing this in a little bit. If you have the mana to spare, power shifting will always get you out of this, but if your team's already in it, it's not really a big deal. Unless you're speedrunning. I think Lady Cerevis ties for easiest boss in Black Fathom Deeps. You just have your tank hold the elite. If they want to parse higher, they just keep them together and you cleave them down. Just make sure that you don't get frozen solid by getting five stacks of the frozen debuff that you accrue when standing in the frozen patch on the ground after she casts freezing arrow. If you so choose, you can also walk the elite into this frozen patch and have him freeze, but the damage on this fight is so little and it's such a quick one that you really don't need to worry about it. If you have the time to get back to 100 energy, it's always good to cast Tiger's Fury before the fight, but if you can't or just forget, don't worry about it. On clear casting procs, the add-on I'm using is called Spell Activation Overlay. I have all of my weak aura and add-ons in the description below that you can just copy and paste or go to the link to download. Things like deadly boss mods really make this a cakewalk, so I highly recommend getting that one. See what I mean when I say this is a quick fight? Right here, I cast Aquatic Form to get ahead of my team because I noticed that I was out of mana and I wanted to have as much as possible going into the next section. This is where the drink walking I mentioned earlier comes in handy. Also, remember when I said don't hit the sea witches? Yeah, but you live and you learn, and then you bring them all the way over here. And then once you hit them, lo and behold, you get frozen in place. Same deal as always with trash, because it goes down so quick, you're really only going to be able to get a few mangles slash shreds on clear casting procs, so just utilize your combo points with Savage Roar whenever they're about to go down and you don't think you can get anything else in. I want to stress the importance of maintaining Savage Roar because 30% increase in physical damage really is substantial. Remain cognizant as to when you're going to be fighting the next boss because you're always going to want to be fully capped on mana like I said previously. But if you have it, just use power shifting to get out of the frozen effect. While we're making our way to the next boss, I can go over some of the buffs and consumables that I'm using. I have all the world buffs, one being the Boon of the Black Fathom from Darnassus, the other being the Ashen Veil event, 5% increase in damage, and then finally the 10% increase from the Dark Moon Fair. As for elixirs, I have one lesser agility and then another ogre strength. The buffs really do make a difference. The elixirs, on the other hand, are only for people who really want to maximize their class, but it's not going to be as noticeable. At the end of the cavern here, we'll reach the shadow-formed murloc known as Galahast. This is a three-part fight that also incorporates a bit of Frogger. If you have a PvP trinket, I like to swap mine in for this because there's a chance you'll get feared, and I prefer not to rely on waiting for a priest to dispel that in order to maintain as much uptime as I can. With how limited the trinket options are in this phase, I find this to be the most useful when comparing it with something like the Warsong Gulch 4 Stamina 10 Spell Penetration trinket, but it's pretty nominal. When pulling these adds in front of the boss, you can tag all of them and then LOS behind this big tree root here that I'll show you shortly. The reason you want to pull them away is that you can accidentally get feared into the boss starting the fight, and nobody really wants that, especially if your healers are oom. 
as we whittle these guys down, you'll notice that I'm not power shifting in order to keep my mana bar as high as possible, so I'm not the one that we're waiting on. In this instance, you can see me try to utilize Tiger's Fury. When you don't have something like a pull timer being used, you just have to kind of guesstimate when is the best time to use it, and in this case, I had 100 energy by the time I first hit the boss. The main thing to know about this fight is after each phase when Gellihast sends his minions out and begins recuperating for the next one, you'll still want to try to be hitting him in order to build combo points to maintain Savage Roar and then get a big 5 point rip when he's susceptible to damage again. Dodge any marching murlocs and avoid the shadow crashes on the ground and you should be able to get him down pretty easily. Because DBM doesn't have a timer for this March of the Murlocs phase yet, you just have to kind of guess when is the best time to cast that Savage Roar and then begin accruing more combo points. I think I was a little bit late on this time, but the goal is to have a 5 point Savage Roar up while you're also getting 5 points for Rip right as he's susceptible to damage again. If you fight the boss in this area, it's pretty rare to get hit by Murlocs, but just keep an eye out for them. Same thing for the circle on the ground with Shadow Crash. Next up is the gauntlet prior to Lorgus Jet. Because he's right here, it's a good idea to start drink walking immediately if you are going for more speed, but a lot of the time groups will just wait here, rebuff, get all their mana, and then start the fight. With how long this has been out and how often people have been doing this, a lot of groups just like to dive right in. I like to build combo points on the elite here prior to the fight. Just make sure somebody is dealing with the kicks on the heal that the spellcaster has, and soon enough everything will be dead and Lorgos will be running down. As you can see here, my mana bar is not even close to being full, so I definitely could have done more damage on this boss if I had been drink walking immediately after, but I wasn't sure how quickly we were going to jump into the gauntlet. There are three totems that Lorgus will drop throughout the fight on a rotation. The Wind Fury totem gives him a buff that allows him to attack multiple times and can really chunk whoever he's attacking. The Molten Fury totem will drop a meatball looking fireball that chases after a random player. So you're going to be running after him as your tank repositions him. The only one you really have to worry about killing is the Corrupted Lightning Shield totem. Once this gets dropped, it essentially is a thorns effect that deals 200 damage per hit to anyone attacking him. If you have deadly boss mods, it'll tell you to stop attacking him and attack the totem. So try to get rid of your combo points before this happens. Otherwise, if you switch targets, you're going to lose out on those combo points, which is a big loss. Next up, unless you're speedrunning and want to pop a free action potion, just be prepared to be either power shifting out of these freezes or standing still a lot with your team. You can choose to either gather everything up and then line of sight so that you AOE everything down at the end of the hull, or you can just take it pack by pack. Second to last, we have Twilight Lord Kelris. Dust, dust. A lot of people consider Kelris to be the most difficult fight in BFD. I think that's probably the case, but as long as everyone does their job, it can remain pretty quick and painless. There are just more mechanics to be cognizant of and play around in this battle, so I'll go through each of them. 
Elris has two things that he casts, one being Mind Blast, the other being Shadowy Chains. You want to ensure that you have somebody who's always going to be kicking chains, and if any go out, you're going to want a priest to dispel the debuff. Before Kelris reaches 35% health, he will send two players continually on a rotation until everyone is gone or you reach 35% of his health bar, the closest ones in proximity to him, down to what I like to call the Shadow Realm, which is downstairs. Just make sure that if you have only two people with an interrupt, that both of them don't get sent down at the same time. My team always likes to send the tank down first and then have something like a pet or someone else taunt so that when he's back, he doesn't get sent down again for the rest of the fight. Once someone goes down, they won't get sent down again. When you're down there, all you have to do is just kill the night elves up until one of them spawns a summoning portal that you click in order to get back into the fight. Kelros will also cast something known as Shadow Crash, which leaves a large pool of damaging shadow magic wherever it lands so your range should be keeping an eye on this and avoiding it. At 35%, anyone who's down in the Shadow Realm will get sent back up to the fight because Kelris will enrage, growing to be a massive size, begin screaming belligerently, and every cast is now uninterruptible. So it's time to DPS like your life depends on it, because it does. If your members want to pop a free action potion at the start of this second phase, it completely negates shadowy chains, which makes your healers a lot happier. As a feral druid, you could just shift out of it. That's why I like to use mana pots instead, and as a gnome, you could just use your gnome racial. Mind Blast is based on proximity as well, so on the second phase, the melee can buddy system so that not everybody's getting hit. I know that was a bit of a mouthful, but as long as everyone knows what they're doing for the most part, and if your heal saves enough mana for phase two, it's a cakewalk. If things are really rough, you can also use Shadow Protection Potions, because that also gives you essentially a second health bar. One thing I will mention, if you know that you're gonna get sent down, Make sure you use your combo points beforehand, otherwise they're wasted. I do a good job of showcasing this right here. It's a good idea to stay near the teammate that you get sent down with. One, because it kills things quicker, but two, so one person doesn't miss the portal or have to run across the room in order to get to it. Because my team got Kelris to 35%, I didn't have to keep killing any Night Elves to get the summoning portal. I just got immediately ported back up, and phase two starts with the Enrage. And there you have it. For the rest of the trash in this room, you can either choose to click all the candles and then AoE everything down at once, or spread it out, it's your choice, but these things don't hit hard and it's very very quick to kill. Last but not least, we have the Dread Beast Akumai. As a Feral Druid specifically, there's not a whole lot you have to worry about in this fight. Only tanks really have to worry about anything. Everyone else just has to dodge the breath that comes periodically. And if you don't have a paladin tank that can completely bubble off the mechanic, invalidating a lot of the stuff that you'd have to worry about, then you just AoE down or kill the adds that spawn when your tank clears their stacks at half time. Similar to Gellihast, when Akumai is invulnerable to damage, this is a good time to keep hitting him to build combo points so that you're ready to either cast a Savage Roar or a 5 point rip in order to maximize your DPS. This is another instance of me not knowing when we're going to pull. So I used Tiger's Fury, but then I never got back up to 100 energy. Not the worst thing in the world, but just something to keep in mind. 
I typically like to power shift a decent amount in the first phase because you're not going to be power shifting when he's invulnerable at around half health. So your mana is going to start regenerating from that. At that point, you can pop another mana pot if you want, and then you're pretty much good to go for the rest of the fight. That's pretty much it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for tuning in. If it was helpful, please give it a like or support the channel by subscribing. As always, I'm always around in the comments to help if you guys have any questions. I love interacting with people. I've had a handful of instances where people have reached out to me in game now to give a compliment on my videos, which is really the coolest thing to me. So if you're on Lone Wolf Alliance, don't be a stranger. I'm also leveling a Horde character on Crusader Strike at the moment for Phase 2, as I know Shamans will just keep getting better and better. I've had a few people also ask if I stream on Twitch. I'm thinking about setting it up this weekend. I think it sounds fun to stream PvP as well as the speedruns that my guild will be doing. They're currently sitting at like a 13 minute run, which is awesome. And I also just hit Exalted on my Druid and Warsong, so I'm going to be casually doing the Revere to Exalted on my Rogue and maybe my Warrior simultaneously, because there's just not a whole lot of other stuff to do right now in preparation for Phase 2, which I'm very excited about. Arathi Basin as a Rogue has been my absolute favorite PvP thing in all of WoW history, so keep an eye out for a guide on that as well. In terms of streaming, I just don't think that streaming to an audience of zero people sounds super exciting. So if you'd like to come hang out, let me know in the comments and maybe I can set a date and time for my first stream. My Twitch name is Severingo, just like my YouTube channel. As always, I appreciate all the views, comments, and general support. This has been a really fun side project slash hobby for me, so any additional encouragement will only continue to help. Take care, guys. Until next time, peace.